Mr. President, thank you for joining us. Good to be with you. Since you announced the agreement with Iran, it appears, if you look at several recent polls, that a majority of the American public oppose it and a majority of the United States Congress oppose it. Why do you think that is? Uh, because people haven't been getting all the information. It's a complicated piece of business. Uh, and we are negotiating with uh, a regime that chants death to America and uh, doesn't have a, a high uh, approval rating here in the United States. Uh, but the people who know most about the central challenge that we're trying to deal with, which is making sure that Iran does not get a nuclear weapon, they are overwhelmingly in favor of it. Experts in nuclear proliferation, nuclear scientists, former ambassadors, uh, Democrat and Republican. Uh, and as a consequence, one of my main tasks uh, over the last several weeks, and this will continue into September, is to make sure that people uh, know and understand that this is a diplomatic breakthrough that ensures we are cutting off all the pathways by which Iran might get uh, a nuclear weapon. In your speech uh, at American University, you made a comparison. You said that Iran's hardliners were making common cause with Republicans. It's come under a lot of criticism. Mitch McConnell says uh, even Democrats who oppose the deal should be insulted. The Wall Street Journal says that this rhetoric shows that you've abandoned the hope of getting any Republicans or even moderate Democrats, and you are uh, targeting this message to the hardcore of House Democrats who are going to sustain your veto. Uh, Fareed, your question is about politics. Let me talk about substance. What I said is absolutely true factually. The truth of the matter is inside of Iran, the people most opposed to the deal are the Revolutionary Guard, the Quds Force, hardliners who are implacably opposed to any cooperation uh, with the international community. And it, there's a reason for that, because they recognize that if, in fact, this deal gets done, that rather than them being in the driver's seat with respect to the Iranian economy, uh, they are in a weaker position. And the, the point I was simply making is that if you look at the facts, the merits of this deal, then you will conclude that not only does it cut off a pathway for Iran getting a nuclear weapon, but it also establishes the most effective verification and inspection regime that's ever been put in place. Uh, it also ensures that uh, we are able to monitor uh, what they do with respect to stockpiles, plutonium, their underground facility, and that it does not ask us to relinquish any of the options that we might need to exercise if, in fact, Iran cheated or if, uh, at some point, uh, they decided to try to break out. And so the reason that Mitch McConnell and the rest of uh, the folks in his caucus who opposed this uh, jumped out and opposed it before they even read it, before it was even posted, uh, uh, is reflective of a ideological commitment not to get a deal done. You don't and in that, that sense, uh, they do have uh, a lot in common with hardliners uh, who are much more satisfied with the status quo. You don't think you're going to get any Republican? Well, I didn't say that. Uh, what I said was that there are those who, if they did not read the bill before they announced their opposition, uh, if they are not able to offer plausible reasons why they wouldn't support the bill, or plausible alternatives in preventing Iran from getting a nuclear weapon other than potential military strikes, uh, then that would indicate that they're not interested in the substance of the issue, they're interested in the politics of the issue. You talked about Iran's uh, hardliners, the old guard. Well, one member of Iran's old guard, guard certainly seems to be Ayatollah Khamenei, the supreme leader. Um, I think if, he would qualify. He would qualify, right? And uh, he seems relentlessly anti-American. Yes. His Twitter feed has posted a likeness of you with a gun pointed to your head. Yes. Uh, is this a guy you can really make a deal with? Well, as I said, uh, Fareed, you don't negotiate deals with 
your friends. You negotiate them with your enemies. And superpowers don't respond to taunts. Superpowers focus on what is it that we need to do in order to preserve our national security and the national security of our allies and our friends. And uh, I think that he tweeted that in response to me stating a fact, which is, is that if we were confronted with a situation in which we could not resolve this issue diplomatically, that we could militarily uh, take out uh, much of Iran's military infrastructure. Uh, I don't think that's disputable. I don't think there's a military expert out there that would, uh, uh, would contest that. Uh, the Supreme Leader obviously doesn't want to hear that, uh, and I understand. But, but I'm not interested in a Twitter back and forth with the, uh, the Supreme Leader. What I'm interested in is the deal itself, and can we uh, enforce it? Keep in mind, Fareed, when we got the interim deal, as you're aware, the way this thing evolved was first we essentially froze their program. They had to roll back uh, their very highly enriched uh, uranium stockpiles. Uh, and for that, we turned on the spigot a little bit so that they could access uh, more of their money. All the same critics of this deal suggested that this is terrible. This is a historic mistake. And for the last two years, as we've been negotiating the more comprehensive deal, uh, not only have they continued to suggest that it was a mistake uh, until very recently, but the Supreme Leader was saying all kinds of anti-American stuff. But the deal held. They did exactly what they were supposed to do. The few times that they didn't, we identified it, told them they had to correct it, and they did. So there's always a gap between rhetoric and action. Uh, and uh, you know, the Supreme Leader is a politician, apparently, just like uh, everybody else. What I'm focused on is, can we make sure that they are doing what they have to do and that we have sufficient safeguards, verification mechanisms, to ensure that they don't have a nuclear weapon? And, and again, for a, it is very important, I think, over the next several weeks to not get distracted by tone, vote counts, is Mitch McConnell's feelings hurt? But let's address the argument. And it, the, the central point I was making yesterday, fairly exhaustively, it was a long speech, was that nobody has presented a plausible alternative other than military strikes to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. Nobody has presented a more effective way to ensure they don't have a, a, a nuclear weapon, including military strikes, because we know actually if this deal is executed, it will provide more limitations on the Iranian nuclear program for a longer period of time in a more verifiable way. Uh, and that central argument hasn't really been effectively contested. Nobody's had a good answer for that. So I think the answer that some might pr provide is that the alternative is not war, but more pressure and a better deal, and specifically that Iran should not have the right to enrich. That exactly. There are a lot of nuclear countries with nu peaceful nuclear programs that don't have the right to enrich. Was, was it impossible to stick hard on that? Was that a concession you had to make? First of all, there's no uh, support for that position in Iran, including opposition members who were subsequently jailed <laughs> back in 2009. So you have a consensus inside of Iran that they should have a right to enrich. The Non-Proliferation Treaty is very clear about guarding against the weaponization of nuclear power, but it does not speak to prohibitions on peaceful nuclear power. And we did not have the support of that position among our global allies who have been so critical in maintaining sanctions and applying the pressure that was necessary to get Iran to the table. And so, in the real world, the alternatives you just described uh, were not available. And you know, I think that the notion that the United States Congress rejecting a deal that has been negotiated by the U.S. Secretary of State, our top nuclear experts, with unanimous support around the world uh, 
other than the state of Israel and perhaps behind the scenes uh, some uh, of our allies who are also suspicious of Iran, uh, that uh, somehow in the face of that, countries like Russia or China would continue to voluntarily abide by uh, sanctions in a way that would uh, continue to put pressure on Iran uh, is a fantasy. And, and I think that's demonstrable. When we come back, much more of my exclusive interview with President Obama from the White House. 